Well, thank you to Jake and to Teen Defenders. And Jake, you need to know your, your passion for life and your passion for this cause and being at your age definitely inspires me. I think it inspires all of us and that we need more youth with that kind of a passion as Jake displays. Senator Anderson, uh, your, your service to our state gives me hope. And thank you for, for pro providing that service to our state. And Bishop Nicholas, thank you for seven years here in Sioux City and what a clarion voice you have been. Matter of fact, I give you and the Catholic Church, the Pope and others for standing steadfast on the issues that truly matter to our family and being a bold and courageous voice. I just pray that all faith leaders would resemble that voice. I've been pro-life all my life because I wasn't given a choice. My parents didn't give me a choice. Anytime I read the word of God, he doesn't give me a choice either. <laughs> but it was at age 16 where the sanctity of human life probably hit home the hardest. See, I was, I was a young high school sophomore, 16 years old, and I was laying on the living room floor trying to take in one of the three television stations that we would get via our rabbit ears. And as I was watching TV on the living room floor, my mom took a phone call, and on the other end of the phone call was my sister from Michigan. And I could tell that the way my mom was communicating to her that she was really upset, really upset. And I had no idea why she was so upset or so distraught, only to find out later that she had just discovered that she was pregnant with her fourth child. And so she called mom because this was an unplanned pregnancy. This was unplanned. And so she was crying out to her mom of, of whatever the emotion was. And I don't remember all the words. I, don't, I didn't hear the words of my sister, but I remember my mom's words very, very clear. Because as my mom was trying to console her, as my mom was trying to console her and say, listen, listen, just listen for a second. We didn't want Bob either. <laughs> and I thought, she just didn't say that. Are you kidding me? And then she said, but what would life be without him now? And I'm thrilled to say that my sister gave birth to a beautiful fourth child who she wouldn't trade for anything, anything today. You see, I come and I bring you good news, and I bring you good news is that you, me, all of us, we are made in the image of God. Just a little bit lower than the angels. Matter of fact, David cries out in Psalm 139, he says, you create my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. You planned and ordained all of my days before one came to be. If our creator plans and ordains all of our days before one comes to be, my guess is he's got a plan for that life. You see, the sanctity of human life isn't something that the Catholic Church just came up with. It's not something that some politician just came up with. The sanctity of human life isn't something that Bob Varenplatz or the family leader that we decided, well, we'll just come up with this deal. This is God's standard. And if it's God's standard, I need to embrace it. We need to embrace it. Society needs to embrace this. I was on a plane with Congressman Ron Paul, when he was running for president, I promise I won't say his name again. As I was on this plane with this congressman from Texas, who happened to be an OBGYN doctor, and we talked about him delivering 4,000 babies over his career. 
which is now what we extinguish per day through abortion. And I remember we flew, we flew into Iowa City and we spoke at the University of Iowa, which is not a conservative pro-life bastion. <laughs> but I remember what Dr. Paul, Congressman Paul, what he said to those students. He said, if you get the sanctity of human life right, my guess is you'll get about everything else right. But if you get the sanctity of human life wrong, the ripple effect is going to be disastrous as well. You see, and I believe with we as a society, if we get the sanctity of human life right, there are going to be a lot of positive ripple effects. And God blesses that. But if we choose wrong, if we get this wrong, there's going to be negative ripple effects to this as well. And we should not expect God's richest blessings on this state or on this country when we get it wrong. See, this is about God's standard. And it's about all human life. And Jake talked about all human life. He talked about Down syndrome and 92% of parents who find out that their child has Down syndrome that they abort. Most of you know my and Darla's story with Lucas. Lucas is now 19 years old, a child that wasn't supposed to be, who shouldn't have made it two months, and definitely not two years. And now he's 19 years old, and he can't walk, and he can't talk. He has a major seizure disorder and a lot of health care issues that bring him on the brink between life and death often. But he has been a dynamic, dynamic blessing in our life. Matter of fact, he has touched many lives. And we get emails and we get letters from his book, Light from Lucas, about how he has touched their life. You see, and it bothers me that we as a society will deem that Lucas's life must not be worth living, that the Down syndrome child's life must not be worth having. See, remember what Jesus said? John 9, verse 1 through 3? You'll remember this story. The disciples were walking along with the master, and they happened along a blind man. And when they happened along the blind man, the, the disciples had the question for Jesus. They said, who sinned? Did this guy sin to create his blindness, his disability, or did his parents sin to create the blindness or disability? You remember what Jesus' response was? Jesus' response was, no one sinned. But this is so the glory of the Father, the works of the Father, might be displayed through him, through his disabilities. Through a child like Lucas, through a child like Wendy with Down syndrome, through those who are disabled, the weak will teach the strong. Their life deserves a purpose as well. And no, they are not perfect. Lucas isn't perfect. Wendy isn't perfect. Matter of fact, none of my kids are perfect. But maybe it's not the perfection in them that God seeks. Maybe it is our response in embracing their life is the perfection that he seeks and allows his glory to be displayed. All human life. Our response. See, this country, we celebrate a culture of life. That is why we will go through the cornfields or the bean fields or whatever the forest may be to find the child that is lost. That's why it rips our heart apart when we find that two girls who are lost in eastern Iowa are brutally murdered. It tears our heart apart. Or what happened at Sandy Hook in Connecticut and me being a former educator to figure out how can something like this happen? And when you see on Saturday Night Live after Sandy Hook, they're now singing Silent Night and it's not a punchline. When you're seeing news anchors saying, we need to pray for See, when we see children, we see their life extinguished and exterminated. We have a culture of life. Our response is also today in, in your march and you being here saying, I'm going to stand up for life. 
I'm going to stand up for God's greatest gift. It may be through policy, as, as Bill talked about. It may be with defunding Planned Parenthood, and we should defund Planned Parenthood. It should be reinserting a conscience policy of saying that for those religious institutions and facilities, they should not have to act outside of their religious beliefs and conscience in delivering pills or practicing abortions. It should be that way. It should also be defining a person at the point of conception, which gives the 14th Amendment real meaning. And saying, that's a person. You see, the founders and the framers, they said, life first. Because it's awfully hard to have the pursuit of liberty and the pursuit of happiness if you don't have life. We have to have a culture of life. But more and more as I look around our society, I believe God's right, it's up to you and it's up to me. I think we need a revival. I think we need a spiritual revival. The likes that this country has never seen. You see, 2 Chronicles 7.14 may have been for the Israelites, but it gives us a glimpse into God's heart. And when you read it and when you see what God's heart is about, God is saying, if my people, if you and me, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways, then I'll hear their prayer from heaven. Then I'll forgive their sins. Then I'll heal their land. But it begins with you and me. And may that be our prayer as we leave here today. That yeah, we hope D.C. does it right. We hope Des Moines does it right. We hope the politicians one day will get it right. But let's pray first that you and I get it right. Our families get it right. Our churches get it right. And let us be that light. Let us be that light that shines so brightly that draws others to it that they would get it right as well. Thank you for your participation on the Sanctity of Human Life Sunday.